Uh, good morning. My name is Jordan. I am one of the pastors here at Renaissance, and I'm really grateful to be with you guys today on this Marathon Sunday. Uh, shout out to everybody who got an extra hour of sleep. Uh, we don't get an extra hour of sleep in our house, but uh, I'm glad for those of you who actually did enjoy it. Uh, so in the early morning of April 15th, uh, 1912, the ship that they said could never sink, sank. The Titanic, uh, it was on its way, and as it was traveling, the captain saw a piece of ice coming out of the water. What they didn't see was a huge mass underneath. The Titanic hit an iceberg and crashed. One of the things that's interesting about icebergs is that about 9 or 10% of the iceberg, iceberg is visible above the surface, but the remaining 90% of the iceberg is something that you can't see. Now, what's true for navigating ships is also true for you navigating your life and your relationship with God. It's not just what you see on the surface. It, it's what lies beneath that is really important and things that you should be paying attention to. Now, as we come to this passage of scripture that Kelly just read on Jesus going into the temple, flipping and turning over tables, making a whip and kicking people out of the temple, it's really not what's on the surface that is the most important thing, but really the, the depth and the meaning of all of this stuff that's beneath the surface that I really want us to pay attention to today. I grew up having heard this story, and I honestly thought that, like, Jesus got hangry, right? Like, so Jesus was on a low-carb diet, and this one day, you know what I'm saying, he saw someone with a bagel, and then he just lost it, like, yo. Uh, and I, I never really understood the spiritual significance or, or meaning of this passage, and quite honestly, it really never moved me to a place that I understood. I hope that if you came in here today having read that scripture or not knowing where to place it, uh, it will move you to a place where you understand and you get a better picture of who Jesus is. Now, one of the goals of us doing the, the, this uh, Gospel of John sermon series is that we would slowly but surely walk us through an entire book of the Bible and we would get more tools on, and learn what it means to how to read the Bible and how to read scripture and, and what to look out for. One of the things that's so fascinating about this scripture is that the, the Gospel of John and the entire Bible, they're not meant to be read in like small chunks. Certainly, it will be impossible to stand up every single week and give you a, a sermon series, a sermon on John 1 through 22. I could never do that. Uh, but the Bible was never meant to be read in, in small chunks. It was meant to be, meant to be read uh, and so we can get kind of swept away in the whole breadth uh, of, of Scripture. It's meant to be read in larger chunks, because if you read it in larger chunks, you start to notice not just what a Scripture means, but what it means in relation to the thing that came before it, what's coming after it. And the authors uh, gave very special attention to where they said things and why they said it. They all have meaning. So, so this passage of Scripture is placed right after what we went through last week, which is Jesus turning water into wine at a, at, a, at a wedding. In one sense, you get Jesus being the dude that everybody wants to have around. Jesus brought the turn up with him. He's the greatest party person ever. And in this context, uh, just a few short verses later, Jesus is coming into the temple uninvited and he's turning over tables. Why is that? Uh, the, the writer in verse 12 says these two words after this. So he talks about Jesus at turning water into wine and this miracle that Jesus had done where really behind the surface, Jesus comes and he turns water into wine. And immediately after this, this same Jesus, this same Jesus is in the temple turning tables over. What do I think that John wants us uh, to get? So in the wedding feast, you have Jesus acting quietly, hidden and privately. Almost nobody knows about the miracle that he's doing in turning water into wine. But here you have Jesus public and dramatic. There he's adding and bringing things into their life, but here he's subtracting and kicking people out. There he was requested. He was asked in. Here he goes where nobody asked him to go. He intrudes and he intervenes. There he brings joy and laughter. Here he brings weeping and confusion and fear. They seem very different, but these two passages of Scripture are actually the same thing. They're doing the same thing. They're showing us what the nature and the character of Jesus is like. If you're like me, then you have a preference for what you would like your Jesus to be like. 
Uh, but I don't want any of us having a version of Jesus that you and I have constructed, because as we said last week, a Jesus that can't challenge you, can't change you. I want us to approach the Bible with, with open hands and open hearts and open eyes, asking God to show us things about who he is that we don't already know. Asking God to show us about what it means to relate to him in ways that we don't already know. Here's what I know to be true. If Jesus comes into your life on one hand, sometimes Jesus will fill your table with a feast. Sometimes your life will be so wondrously blessed because of the work and the activity of God in your life, and other times he will turn the table and spill everything over to the ground. But it's the same Jesus. And if you're going to invite him into your life to direct your life, sometimes it will be a feast, sometimes it will be turning over tables, but it's the same Jesus both times. Now, I think what makes people uncomfortable with Jesus here in the scripture is that he doesn't always line up to what we want him to be. It's interesting because one of the best ways, if I were to want to remove the tension from your lives right now, what I would do is I would explain why Jesus went in there and turned the tables over. And if it's a reason that you can agree with, it would make sense. And then we would go on for the rest of today and it would make sense to you and we would all be on the same page But we're not going to do that today because that's not how the people received it. All they knew is Jesus came in turning over tables. All they knew is that Jesus brought in a commotion when everything else was seeming to go kind of according to plan. And this is the way that most people uh, struggle with in in terms of texts like this because we want to know kind of why things happened and we want to know the reasoning behind things. And sometimes that's, that's a good thing to be inquisitive and to use our minds, but sometimes it's really just a search for control. It's really us grasping at trying to be the captains of our own, our own ships. Um, sometimes in our own lives, Jesus will give us, he'll come in and turn the tables over our life with no explanation behind. This is what we see happening in the scripture, and we see this happening all throughout the Bible. Jesus comes in, uh, God comes in, and people's lives get turned upside down, and there's no explanation we see this in the book of Job, the, the, the wonderful story of um, human suffering. And Job's life is turned completely uh, 180 degrees around. His life is flipped upside down. And for 40 chapters, Job wanders and, and wanders through this misery of suffering and, and challenges. And God doesn't say nothing to him. Finally, 40 chapters in, God finally comes in and, and still doesn't answer him. and just says, yo, bro, where were you when I made lightning? Where were you? And Job was like, now I see. What did Job see? Job saw himself in relationship to an all-powerful God. I think what's happened over the years is that our culture has increasingly uh, lost power distance with people who are truly in authority. In some ways, that's really good because uh, power corrupts people, for sure. And we've needed to, we've absolutely needed to be able to call people who are in power to, to question, to be able to hold them accountable. And I think what's happened in culture, which some of that is really good, has trickled into our relationship with God to where we need to know and understand why God is doing everything before we'll say yes. We see the same thing with Adam and Eve in the garden. If you go back to the original place that God communicates with humankind, what you see is that God says, listen, there's all of these trees. Don't eat from that one. Now, some scholars have come along and say, well, maybe that tree was like poisonous and that it was like it was something in it that would have harmed them. And that's why God did it. We never know why God said, don't touch it. That's not the point. The type of relationship with God that I want you to have, the type of uh, the type of faith that I want you to have is one that will follow Jesus in directions that you're unaware of where it's going to take you. That's where the magic happens. That's where God wants to move all of us as people of faith, whether you're brand new or whether you are. Uh, been following Jesus for a long time. So we're in this text, and Jesus is turning over the tables, and, and nobody knows why. And one of the things that I think it's meant to do for us is to bring a curiosity to us. Why would Jesus do this? And that we would always approach the Bible and different texts, uh, uh, different passages in Scripture with curiosity. As the prophet Kendrick Lamar once said, to sit down and to be humble. <laughs> to approach it with a humility. That, God, I don't know the direction that I'm supposed to be going in. That the fact that you have degrees and and good relationships with people and all these different things does not mean that you, that your perception about who God is and what uh, what it means to follow him in the nature and the character of Jesus is complete or accurate. 
What does it mean to be humble? It means to be not proud or haughty, not arrogant or assertive. I think we're all familiar with that one. It also means reflecting, expressing, or offered in a spirit of, of deference or submission. And that's a dirty word in our culture. The last one is one I want to focus in on in terms of the type of humility that a Christ follower should have is ranking low in hierarchy or scale. Someone who ranks low in the organization doesn't come into the, the president's, uh, the CEO's office telling them to change the strategy of the organization. They're like, yo, I, I unload the mail. That's, that's my job. And they're okay with that. As long as them checks is coming every two weeks, they're like, yo, as long as them checks keep coming, bro, we good. You just keep doing what you're doing. I'll do what I do. I think a lot of us have lost humility in our approach to God. That we, don't, we have not ranked ourselves lower in hierarchy to, to God and to Scripture. There's a warning in Scripture that says, don't let anybody think more highly of themselves than they ought to. The author says that because there's a tendency for you and I to think of ourselves more highly than we should. And that's a really bad reason for a couple of reasons. One is that you and I have, and we operate with something called biases, in that we don't approach anything objectively. There is a predisposed bias that you have in almost every single um, arena of life, and you don't approach anything objectively. What you're listening for is actually to confirm your bias. A few years ago, um, or last year, I was noticing that I was like reading all of these nerdy theological books, and I said, you know what, I'm going to read a book that has nothing to do with my job, that has something that nothing, I could never use it in a sermon, something I could just read and enjoy. So I uh, went to, through the New York Times bestselling list, and I found a book called Never Split the Difference. It's a, a memoir and a book written by an FBI hostage negotiator. And really, my motivation was like, this is going to teach me skills on how to talk to my three-year-old. And it's going to be <laughs> really helpful. Three-year-olds are basically terrorists that are cute. They're, that's what they are. And in the book, uh, I, I was reading. And then like halfway through it, I was like, all right, let me go ahead and start taking my notes out. Because, man, this is just so good. What the FBI hostage negotiator realized was back in the day, uh, they would have one person listening on a conversation. And that person would miss so much. Think about it. An FBI negotiator trained uh, with one job to listen to this person who was holding all these people in captivity. What they noticed was that even in the most extreme circumstances where it benefits everyone for you to just listen, they can't do that. So eventually, what they started to do is what we see on the movies. They would have rooms full of people where everybody's like the guy's on speakerphone and there's like all these different people in the corner doing different things. And you have teams of people who listen because what they found is we engage in selective listening, hearing what we want to hear, our minds active on a cognitive bias for consistency rather than truth. What does this mean? It means that even when you approach scripture, what you're looking for more than anything else is consistency. You want a version of Jesus that is consistent with what you believe and what you have already received him and accepted him to be rather than truth. And if we're lucky, if we're lucky, every now and then, Jesus will turn the tables up a little bit in our lives. And is it shocking? Yes. But it's also meant to awaken us to the mystery of who Jesus is and what, he, uh, what it means to, to relate to him. Now, not only do we have biases which make us selectively listen, and by doing that, we miss out on so much truth about what it means to be in relationship with God and who God is. But I think in our culture, in our generation, man, we have really strong feelings about stuff, and we have really strong instincts. And one of the, the biggest tragedies of our generation is that we believe culturally that the more you believe something, the more it has to be true, that the strength of belief equals the strength of the argument. It's something that our, our culture is, is really steeped in, and very personally, I certainly know that to be true. We just kind of think that because I feel this or because my instinct leads me to this direction, then it, it must be true. And that includes your instinct about and your feelings about who Jesus is and what it means. I've talked to so many people over the years that have started the conversation off with, well, I'll never believe in a God who does... X, Y, and Z. And what is that? We're believing and trusting our instincts about who we think God is more than what 
uh, is revealed to us in Scripture. One of the truest things about God is also true about human beings, that, we, that our perception is limited in terms of how much we can perceive and gather about someone without that person having to reveal things about them. My wife and I did something called a genogram with uh, one of uh, my mentors, and essentially a genogram is walking through your family tree, and not just the names and where they lived, but their, their habits, their dysfunctions, who they are, and kind of how you became who you are as a person. And man, after we did that genogram, looking at like her grandparents and their marriage and their relationship issues and all the different things that were going on, and then her parents, and then, and then it got down to her, and I was like, man, this makes sense. Like, you make a whole lot more sense now than you, than you ever have. That was revealed to me. There were some things that I could never just perceive just from looking at her or having a conversation with her about uh, small stuff. Our instincts are limited, and sometimes they will tell us to do things that are just wrong. A couple weeks ago, my wife and I went to Sequoia National Park, and as soon as we got there, there were all these signs and different park rangers telling you what you should do if you see a bear. And the first thing they say is, if you see a bear, don't run. Now, we're a diverse church. (laughs) But black people, we run. If something happens, I'm running. But if you were to do that, that joint would be like the revenant, right? You know what I'm saying? Like, it would be the worst possible outcome if you were to run from a bear. Really, what you're supposed to do, they say, is to crouch down and to play dead. Thank God we did not see a bear, because I would have I ran and left my wife behind me. Uh, <laughs> but the last thing inside of me, the, I would have never just felt like, you know what? It's a good idea to just lay down. <laughs> Nothing inside of me would have felt like that's a good idea. It would feel like I'm just giving myself up to this bear, but in reality, that's, that's the best way forward. Uh, what's true about a, a bear is even truer of God. You might have a feeling and an instinct about what it means to relate to God, what it means to come to God, what it means to submit your life to God, but that feeling may or may not be correct, and oftentimes it is incorrect. So we're coming to the scripture hoping and to learn things about Jesus that we didn't know already. Uh, And what does this passage of scripture tell us about who Jesus is? Uh, It tells us that Jesus is a prophet who challenges the spiritual consumer. Jesus is a priest who cleanses us, and Jesus is more powerful than we could ever imagine. Jesus is a prophet who challenges the spiritual consumer. So what's going on in this passage of Scripture? Every year, uh, the Jewish people would gather for a celebration in Jerusalem for something called Passover. Passover was a huge day in Israel. It was a day that they would celebrate God's deliverance from Egypt uh, through the, the Red Sea, where they would an, an eventually uh, move to the Promised Land. And the Passover was a really big deal. So much so that people would come from all over the, the ancient world to, back, to be back in Jerusalem. Now, they would come back to the temple because the temple was a very specific place that they believed that the presence of God dwelled in the temple. Earlier on in the, the life of the, the, the children of Israel, there was something called a tabernacle that God would come and meet with the people. And if you wanted to meet with God, you had to go to a place. So the children of of Israel, if they wanted to meet with God and celebrate what God had done, they had to go to the temple. Now, that brought up a problem because part of the, the Passover worship was celebrating through having sacrifices. And if you're coming from five or 10 or 15 or 50 miles away, you don't want to bring your own goats with you. Right? You might do CrossFit, but you can't carry a goat 50 miles. So they were, for convenience reasons, they would have um, a marketplace set up. Originally, a marketplace started on the outside, but eventually that market got so big and so blustering that it made its way into the temple. So people could go and they could just buy their, their, their dove, their sheep, or their cow, whatever it was that they were sacrificing. They could buy it right there. They didn't have to go. So here's what happens. Uh, in the text, it says the Jewish Passover was near, and so Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling oxen, sheep, and doves, and he also found the money changers sitting there. After making a whip out of cords, he drove everyone out of the temple with their sheep and oxen. He also poured out the money changers' coins and overturned the tables. He told those who were selling doves, 
Get these things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. And his disciples remember that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. The tension in this passage is between consumerism and true worship. The temple was supposed to be the place that they were going to meet God. But instead, they turned it into a place that would best suit their needs. If you're not careful, if you are not careful, you will turn your relationship with God, you will turn church, you'll turn community, you'll turn your friendships, you'll turn whatever you can against its intended purpose back to being what suits you best. Listen, I have a lot of prayer requests. I have a lot of things that I want from God. And there are times when the pursuit of what I want from God replaces God. Jesus comes to this temple, this place that is supposed to be the meeting place where where divinity meets humanity. And instead of people's attention being locked in and focused on what God had done and what God was promising to do uh, to them and through them, they were having cows running through. Now, I'm all for... um, I'm all for a good song, and, you know, praise God for, for talented people like Kelly who come and, and, and kill songs like she, just, uh, like she just did. But that song sounds different if you got a cow walking through. Like, once you're, if you're tuned in, you're dialed in, and then uh, a sheep starts walking through making noise, your attention is immediately going to be divided. Jesus, in his anger, starts kicking everybody out of the temple because it was no longer accomplishing the task for which it was designed. It was designed to be a place where you can connect with God. There's, this is a, a warning for us, for all of us, to reconsider what it is that we want from God. Why is it that you are here today? What is it that you're, you're, you're really after? The goal is that we would meet God. Jesus drove all the temple people out of the temple, and as he uh, pushed everyone out of the temple, uh, he was cleansing it so that people could actually meet with God. Now, Jesus oftentimes in this passage of Scripture is referred to as uh, like he is making the temple holy. The, the temple is being made, made, made holy. And uh, one of the things that's really interesting about holiness is um, if you grew up going to church, like holiness might mean something that it's not supposed to mean. Uh, in college, I was uh, around a bunch of people who were part, like Pentecostal and apostolic, and uh, anybody who grew up in that faith tradition, they know they take holiness to the next level. Like for real, jean skirts down to the, to the floor, no makeup, um, no dancing, no movies. Like it was, I mean, it was, it was very restrictive. And for them, holiness meant completely separate from everything. Now, their intentions were certainly good, but that's not necessarily what holiness is about. Holiness is not about separation. Holiness is about usage. A a pot could be holy, not because it's necessarily, it looks different than other pots, but because this pot is intended for use in the temple. So things were holy, not because they looked different, because they were so weird or, or, or strange, but because they were intended for a specific use. Jesus cleanses the temple, uh, and he pushes us and pushes against uh, any other usage that you and I would have in our relationship with him. That if we're trying to use God for something else, uh, it's not holiness. It's not holiness in the sense of this old archaic word, but holiness in the sense that God has intended for you and him to be in relationship. And he doesn't want anything coming in between that. God intends for your life to be used for his glory. And he doesn't want anything coming in between that. And God deserves that, if nothing else. I heard a quote this week about this concept of, of consumerism and how oftentimes we, we let things get in the way of the pursuit that God wants us to have. And here's what one author says. I'll read it. He says, too many of us are interested in a preferential Christianity and not the presence of God. But here's the great news. Jesus loves you too much to serve as your mascot for your life. Jesus is too lovely and beautiful and majestic and holy to be your mascot. He is your Lord. Jesus is a prophet who is going to challenge the spiritual consumerism, not just of his day, but of ours. Oftentimes, there's even worship songs where we sing songs like, God, come into this place. We invite you in. And I don't know that we know what we're asking for when we do that. 
if God was to really come in this place, if he was to really come in our lives, he might not just come in turning water to wine, but he might come in flipping some tables over. Yeah. And here's the saddest thing and the craziest thing about this. Man, none of these people noticed how offensive this would be to Jesus. You have religious officials, priests, and prophets, and all these different people who are engaged, and their full-time job is to run the temple. Slowly but surely, things started to drift in this direction to where it was so abhorrent to Jesus that he kicked everybody out. I think what's true about the priests is also true about our lives, that all of us are in the danger of drifting, and we don't even notice it anymore. We don't even notice how bad... Man, we don't even notice how bad our partying has gotten. It started with just chilling with the fellas every now and then, and before you know it, uh, it's completely out of control to the point to where it's causing you to behave in ways that are just wrong. We don't even notice how the language that we use and the gossip and the things that we just let slide go, and we don't even notice it. And, and oftentimes it's because, man, we're the last people to notice dysfunction in our lives sometimes, which is why we need community and we need people around us and we need to come into contact regularly with scripture. In the book of James, it tells us that the Bible is like a mirror, that it shows us who we really are and what was really going on in our lives. So Jesus is this prophet who challenges us and Jesus is also a priest who cleanses us. The Bible says in verse 15, it says, after, after making a whip of, out of cords, he drove everyone out of the temple with their sheep and oxen he also poured out the money changers' coins and overturned tables. It says he makes a whip out of cords and drives them all out of uh, the temple. And scholars have called this Jesus cleansing the temple. So the temple is a place where God and, and people meet. And what Jesus is doing is getting everything out of there so that there will be no distractions and nothing in between the people and God. One of the things that's interesting about this, this passage of Scripture is that a lot of times we read it from the perspective of the people who were the money changers. Or we read it from the perspective of people who would have been offended and not from the perspective of people who were being kept from the presence of God. Jesus is not trying to take nothing from you. Jesus is not trying to take things from you. He's not trying to take happiness and joy from you. He's trying to remove the things in your life that you think are going to bring you happiness, that you think are going to make you, make you good, so that there's nothing in between you and God. Paul picks up on this concept of the temple later in, the gospel, in uh, his, his, his uh, writing to the Corinthian church. It says in verse uh, 19 and 20 of 1 Corinthians, Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought at a price. So glorify God with your body. One of the functions of Jesus and the Holy Spirit in your life is to wake us up uh, and to cleanse the temples of our, of our hearts, to drive out things that keep us from, from God. One of the more profound things about this text is that Jesus is starting in an area that the religious officials didn't think needed to be cleansed. They had all these purity laws about what it meant to, to follow God and to come into contact with God. They would have told you, here are the 312 things that need to be cleansed with all these people. But Jesus was coming to them in an area that they didn't even think was a problem. I think that's because we operate with, with blind spots. We operate with blind spots. There are things about you, and I said a couple minutes ago, that you're the last person who notices this. And this is not just personally. This is also societally and culturally. There are things that we're doing right now that we accept as normal and okay that 50, 60, 70 years from now people will laugh at. I was listening to a podcast called This American Life, and they did an episode on love. And on this episode, they started talking about how the entire medical community was all in favor of not picking up your kids, not giving your kids love, not hugging your kids and kissing your kids. And that if you really want your kids to be healthy and survive, don't hug them and don't kiss them. Now, now we know how detrimental it is for children to not be hugged and to be loved they lose their ability to, to connect with people as adults. But back then, what was happening was there was this epidemic that was going on. Doctors and nurses weren't washing their hands as much. And the, child, the children that were being picked up were getting sick. So they said, well, since the kids that are getting picked up are getting sick, don't pick up the kids. And entire beliefs about how to handle kids were 
you know, led countless families into doing something that now we would think about is absolutely ridiculous. All of us pick up kids, hug kids, kiss kids because they're cute. They need it. There's a bonding that happens between mom and dad and, 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 and the baby when you just surround it with love. 70 years from now, there'll be things that we're doing right now that we have accepted as normal and as good that people will look back on and laugh at. Not just uh, as a society, but even in your own life. If you look back seven years ago to what you did and believed about a, a, a whole host of things, you look back at yourself and you say, I was an idiot. The future you always thinks that the present you is an idiot. <laughs> we all have blind spots, and God in his nature and his mercy, in his mercy he comes to us and he flips the tables up. Now, some people have had a problem with what Jesus did because it was pretty violent, and I don't want to sanitize Jesus down to this, you know, the Mary had a little lamb whose fleece was white as snow, and the, the Jesus with, you know, with, uh, with blue eyes and uh, holding a lamb in his arm, uh, the, the pictures that you see. That's not Jesus. But Jesus comes to us, and he turns over tables in his mercy. It is his mercy that leads him to turn over the tables. You want to know what hatred would be? If Jesus saw dysfunction and walked away and didn't say anything. This is why gossip is so uh, uh, deadly and, and sinful, because gossip has conversations about things with everybody but the person that could actually make a change. But Jesus comes directly to the people so that there is no ambiguity about what's going on, and he comes directly to them because real love will confront you. Real love will always confront you. Now, one of the things that's so profound about Jesus in this text is that it shows us what the gospel is. What is the gospel? The gospel is that God always comes before repentance. God in his grace always comes before change. So many of us have grown up with this belief that once I change, God will accept me and love me. What, this, what does the story tell us about Jesus? Jesus comes to a people who are ignorant and naive, completely blind of what's going on, and he comes to them, turns over tables, gets their attention to cleanse the temple. God's grace always comes before repentance. In the scripture, it tells us that it's God's kindness, his kindness, not his anger, not his wrath, his kindness that leads us to repentance, that turns us in the direction towards him and away from the things that are separating us from him. That's the order. It's always God's grace, then our repentance, not turning away from things. Jesus comes to us because he loves us, not in spite of love for us. Thirdly and lastly, this text shows us that Jesus is more powerful than anything that we can imagine, anyone or anything that we can imagine. But one of my personal struggles the last couple of years to be quite honest, has been uh, in my prayer life. Uh, I feel like I've had a number of unanswered prayers over the years, and that has kind of led me, in some ways unknowingly, to lower my expectations on what God could do. And I've been very grateful to have been awakened sometimes to the power and the, ma the power of, uh, of Jesus. And this is what we see in the scripture. Jesus is more powerful than we can imagine uh, Verse 18 through 22, it says, So the Jews replied to him, What sign will you show us for doing these things? So let me stop there for a quick second. So they asked Jesus for a sign because they wanted to know by what authority was he going to come in and start treating the temple like it was his home. Uh, my wife and I, we like to do Airbnbs because we get to get a living room, and sometimes if we're traveling with other people, we get to all have one spot and, and hang out. And one thing that we're always conscious of, conscious of is to restore the apartment or the house back to the owner's specifications because black people already have a hard time getting Airbnbs and we need that five-star rating. So <laughs> we're always reading all of the instructions and putting everything exactly back to where they want it to be because it's not our house. I can't rearrange stuff in someone else's house. Now, at my own house, I can do whatever Jessica wants me to do. I can do that's... <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> But in someone else's house, I have to do whatever the owner says to do. The authority that Jesus is saying that he has is that he can go, Jesus, the son of a carpenter from Nazareth, can go into the heart of Jerusalem, into the temple, to where that God meets humanity and say, this is my house, and kicks everybody out and reestablishes the order that is supposed to be there. Jesus will not operate a place in your life 
man, you want Jesus? Jesus will not operate a place in your, he will not live in a place of your life that's tucked in the back corner in the crevice somewhere that you bring out every now and then when you feel like it's convenient for you. Jesus comes in and he completely um, claims authority, claims authority. And the better news is you should want him to have that. See, a lot of us are afraid of power, but you shouldn't be afraid of power. You should be afraid of power in the wrong hands. Power in the wrong hands is deadly. And we've seen this. There's countless examples of this. But power in the right hands is life-giving. The same Jesus that exercises power is also the one that lays down his power, lays down his life for us, not just his friends, but for his, his enemies. This is a Jesus that has all power. And um, as the scripture goes on, it says, Jesus answered, destroy the temple and I will raise it up in three days. Therefore, the Jews said, this temple took 46 years to build and you'll raise it up in three days. But he was speaking about the temple of his body. So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that and he said this, and they believed the scripture and the statement that Jesus has made. Now, they're asking Jesus for a sign. And what does it mean that they're asking Jesus for a sign? They want immediate proof that Jesus is who he says he is. And Jesus points towards the resurrection, that he will ultimately show himself to be God in the flesh, who has raised, his own, raised himself from the dead. And a lot of times, I, I see this to be true in my life and the life of so many people in this congregation, that we really don't have a lot of prayer requests sometimes. Sometimes we have prayer demands that unless God does this, I'm not going to believe in him. or I'm not going to submit my life in his direction. Jesus is not going to be do tricks for us. I grew up with dogs and we would love to, you know, teach our dogs how to give high fives and roll over and go get the mail or uh, whatever people teach their dogs. Jesus won't be domesticated. D.A. Carson says it like this. A sign that would satisfy them, presumably some sort of miraculous display performed on demand, would have signaled the domestication of God. That sort of God does powerful stunts to maintain allegiance. Does Jesus need to do a powerful stunt to maintain allegiance? No. That's why he doesn't do a sign. And that kind of allegiance is not worth having. A God who performs signs on demand is no God at all. That's called a pet. Week after week, we ask you, we, we stand on stages and we, we, in community groups, we hope that people are continually putting their faith and trusting in Jesus, not demanding that Jesus give them a sign that, God, if this is the way you want me to go, then prove it by doing this. But that God has already proven it. In Romans 8, it says, um, Paul, as he talks about uh, the nature of Jesus and the nature of divinity and the nature of God, says, if God didn't spare his own son, then will he not along with him also graciously give us all things? Meaning that if Jesus is going to lay down his life, like what else, what else do you need? Like is the job really going to make you now believe in Jesus? Is the relationship finally going to make you believe in Jesus? Wow. Having more money in your account, whatever it is that we want from God. And again, I have a lot of prayer requests and I, I think that God calls us to pray with expectancy that he can move and he does move in the life of his children. But I want us to have a better approach to Jesus as one who truly is all-powerful. And not just that he's all-powerful, but he's using his power for our benefit. Let me pray for us. God, our good and gracious Father, I am grateful that you are calling us to meet you. And you challenge our consumerism. You don't let us operate and behave in ways that crowds you out. And God, you cleanse us, and you, you kick things out, and you move things around, sometimes in very uncomfortable ways, and you do it because you're powerful, and you use your power for our benefit. Help us to trust you. Help us to lay down our lives in the direction of you. Help us to have more and more confidence that we can build our life on you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.